I think America, Americans are going to be petrified about what is going to be in store for the country in the final four months leading up to the election. And I think this is going to be a huge headwind for the economy, both for households and also for basically companies, because companies are going to say, well, you know, if you look at the Roundtable CEO survey, already shows that CapEx spending is going to be flat to down this year. So there's no doubt about that. I think like nobody's going to be like in this right mind. It's going to be investing, hiring, spending in the final four months, because I think it's going to get very scary. My big prediction in 2020 before the election was that there was going to be blood on the street. I worry this time there will be a lot more blood on the street. David Wu, CEO of David Wu Unbound, which is a global forum devoted to the promotion of fact-based debates about markets, politics, and economics. And also, David, the former head of global interest rates, foreign exchange, emerging markets, fixed income strategy, and economics research at Bank of America. David, it is so great to welcome you on the show. Thank you so much for taking the time to join me today. Thank you for having me. Well, I am so excited to have you, and I want to hear what you are up to today, but I also want to start where I always start with my guests, and that is to get their big picture macro view, the framework in which they are looking at the world today. And one of the things about this show, David, is you can take all the time you need to set the stage. Yeah, I I think, you know, listen, I I think my my stage is very simple. Like, I think, you know, I'm an an economist by training. I've got an economics economics PhD from Columbia University. I started working at the IMF. You know, I worked on Wall Street as an economist for many years. So I would argue in the last 25 years, if you knew some economics, you did reasonably well on Wall Street. And that was because we live in a world in which economics was driving politics and geopolitics. And then when economics is driving politics and geopolitics, you know, the economic outcome and market outcome is what I would call a uniform distribution. The last five years, I would argue, we now move into a world in which politics and geopolitics are now driving economics. And I think as a result, I think economic and market outcome have become much more bimodal or even multimodal for that matter. And this is the reason why I actually think it's become very difficult to make money. I mean, I think this is the reason why if you look at, especially for macro investors, right? I mean, like there used to be a time not so long ago that you have three good years and you have one bad year and then three good years and one bad year. And literally in the last few years, it's like one good year, one bad year, one good year, one bad year. Like last year was a good example. If you look at average macro, you know, global macro hedge funds, it was up only 1.7% when you could have basically made 5.2% by just being low three month treasury bills. So I think from that point of view, my general framework these days is really trying to understand the intersection between economics, politics, and geopolitics. Because I think we need to understand the chicken and egg cause and effect and trying to make sense in order to make a prediction that's no longer continuous, but generally speaking, by modo or something else for that matter. And so from that point of view, that's these days, I spend a lot of time thinking about these things. Yeah. So the the framework. So when you look at that framework, how do you kind of extrapolate that? Like, where are we today in the global macro economic picture? Like, what does that look like for you today? Right. So if you look at this, right, a good example is, of course, you know, 2024 U.S. election. Right. I mean, so, I mean, how do you think about the election? For me, much, much less interesting is what's going to happen the day after the election. Far more interesting is what's going to happen before the election, because what happens before the election is going to influence how the economy is going to basically perform and how the market is going to basically perform. Right. Now, one thing we do know is that the last 60 years, okay, average GDP growth in the United States, okay, is much higher in the fourth year of any presidential cycle than the third or second or third year for that matter. Because, you know, like incumbent presidents, parties want to get reelected. So from that point of view, they tend to juice up the economy just like everywhere else in the world. So from that point of view, the starting point, okay, and this is why the market got so excited coming to this year because in the election year, because you know that basically that, you know, that politicians want to get the economy right in the election year. Okay. Now, however, I would argue this year is a bit more complicated, right? Because if you think about this, right? I mean, like 
for Biden, right now Biden's approval rating is at just basically south of 40%, depending on which poll you look at. We know the last five, 75 years, no president has ever been reelected with an approval rating less than 40. So Biden has a lot of work to do, and the only thing he can do to basically make this into a competitive race is by getting the economy right, right? Because as we all know, you know, if you look at real medium household income in the U.S., it's lower today than the day that Biden became president because inflation has outstripped wage growth for most of the last three years, okay? So from that point of view, getting the economy right is the only way that Democrats can do to make this election a competitive race. Now, so I think it's obvious, you know, if you think about this, you know, these people at the White House, Brainard, Yellen, all these people, they're sitting on the table, so what do they need to do? They need a soft landing, okay, if Biden's approval rating is to basically improve. They, in order to get a soft landing, they need the, they need the Fed to cut interest rates, right? But however, <laughs> like, well, inflation is pretty sticky. What do you do? The only way they can basically give the Fed the perfect excuse to cut interest rates is by, guess what? Pushing down oil price some more. So from that point of view, we all know, the whole world knows that Biden, in his quest to get reelected, he needs lower oil price. In fact, this is what these guys have been doing the last year, right? This is why the U.S. simply stopped enforcing the oil sanctions on Iran. This is the reason why October, Biden even told the Venezuelan dictators that he's going to basically cut him some slack and then remove some sanctions so that they can ex export more oil. So the administration has been devoted itself on trying to drive down oil price in order to ensure a soft landing for the economy, in order to get the Fed cut rates, in order to get basically Biden elected. The problem now, and this is where game theory comes in, this is where it gets very interesting, because you and I know this, you think Iran doesn't know this? You think Putin doesn't know that? You think Prince basically bin Salman, Mohammed bin Salman, Saudi Arabia don't know that? They all know that. I mean, let me tell you this, Iran knows, okay, Iran knows that Biden needs low oil price. Therefore, Iran knows that Biden will basically do everything, anything to avoid a regional war. This is the reason why Iran literally <laughs> is taking Biden and U.S. foreign policy hostage right now by getting the Houthis to fire at will into the Red Sea, knowing that they can do this with impunity. And that is driving up oil price because they're trying to use this to basically pressure Biden to basically push Israel down the toilet. I happen to live in Israel, by the way. I am in Israel right now. But I can tell you that 90% of Israelis, okay, have made up their mind that there's not gonna be a ceasefire. That this, for them, is an existential struggle, they're gonna go all the way to the end. So from that point, what I'm telling you is that this is a good example, right? We have an election, the president is trying to do everything to get the stock market up, to get the economy up, but because people know what this election is about, American adversary, whether it's the Russians or the Saudis or basically Iran, you know, geopolitical risk is probably gonna remain very elevated. <laughs> And this becomes a very interesting tug of war. And this is the reason why oil prices have gone up. If you look at actually gasoline price in the U.S., you know, it was down basically whatever, 25% in, in the fourth quarter of last year. That was what gave the, such a big boost to U.S. consumers. That's fizzled out. In fact, oil prices are now basically shifting higher. So this is where geopolitics and politics become a huge driver of economics and markets for that matter. Yeah. Yeah, it's a good point. On the um, economic front here in the U.S., you're talking about um, inflation, higher oil prices, and there's been a lot of debate. A lot of folks were expecting some rate cuts from the Fed this year. I had a guest on who thinks that the next move is a rate hike. Curious like what you're thinking about as it relates to um, the Federal Reserve's interest rate policy. I think the first thing we have to understand about the Federal Reserve is this. This is the single most important, everybody needs to know, okay, which is that if we look at, okay, the average change of the Fed funds rate in each of the U.S. basically presidential year, okay, over the last 60 years, what you find is that the Fed tends to be the least active in the fourth year of any presidential cycle, okay? So again, if you compare what the Fed does typically in the fourth year of a presidential cycle versus the third year, second year, first year, the Fed tends to basically do the minimum. And the reason is pretty obvious. 
because the Fed loves its independence. The Fed does not want to be seen as basically casting the most decisive vote in any election, whether it's by hiking rates or cutting interest rates. This is the reason why, you know, basically Powell told you back in December, they're going to cut three times this year. By the way, on that day when he declared that they're going to cut three times in 2024, that day the market was pricing four cuts. <laughs> okay. The reason why he made a pre-commitment almost, it was because he needed to buy some political insurance. So that if he ended up cutting rates, he can say, well, I told you so already back in December 2024, 2023. So from that point of view, and in fact, they had to do it in December instead of waiting to the next forecasting cycle would have been basically in March, because by March, you know, by then, it, you know, I think Donald Trump is probably going to become the Republican pre presidential nominee. If they start telling you they're going to cutting rates there, Trump is going to say like, you know, you guys are rigging the election. So from that point of view, this is the mindset of the Fed to begin with. We need to understand. Now, obviously, the, recently, the market has dramatically reined back rate cut expectations because the economy has been stronger than expected. Now, we have to understand why. Is it, you know, so, so everybody's all of a sudden impressed. Wow, well, the economy is doing so well. <laughs> like, why? We have to ask ourselves, is it due to, like, structural factor? Or is it due to one-off factors? What is it? What does it come down to? In my view, there were two main reasons why the economy did so well, because we're talking, we're just still basically in February, right? We only have data from January. So most of the good data relates to the second half of last year, right? The second half of last year, the economy was on fire. Was it grew on average almost 4%. I mean, that was like unbelievable. The question is what? And whether whatever factors that were driving US growth in the second half of last year, are they sustainable into 2024? I just gave you one reason. One reason was because of the collapse in energy price that we saw in the fourth quarter. That collapse in the energy price, again, you know, you, you have to be an economist to actually understand this because like this is the numbers. Like again, national gasoline price went from $3.80 to $3. That's a 25% drop. In annualized terms, that's like a 100% drop. That basically was a huge boost to real purchasing power, to real basically, you know, basically uh, cons you know, consumption growth. Okay, so that was the one first reason why, and then I'm telling you that's not going to happen again because the geopolitical risk, also because the ability for the U.S. to produce more oil at this point is very, very limited, given that the number of rig count is actually falling. The second reason why the U.S. economy had a banner second half last year was because U.S. government spending was on fire. Now, you, I mean, people don't remember this. It was like, well, you know, the government had budgeted a lot of money during COVID that didn't get spent. And the Republicans were threatened to take this money back, okay? And guess what? The Biden administration just told him, all the agencies, spend this money before you lose it. <laughs> so everybody was going out to spend it. Do you realize, I mean, most Americans don't realize this, but government spending at the federal and local level in the second half of last year contributed one third of GDP growth <laughs> in the second half of last year. That is one, to say, if you one take third? away government spending, GDP growth would have been like, you know, like 1.8%, whatever it was, okay? The government hiring accounted for like 25% of all hiring. I mean, the government sector is relatively small. So what I'm telling you is that, and that has no room, that, that is over. That is completely over, by the way, completely over. I mean, we're lucky if we don't get a government shutdown, okay, next month, because the Republicans now are definitely going to draw a line. I mean, because we're not going to an election year. They have no interest to give the economy any boost, by the way. So from that point of view, the collapse in oil price and this massive surge in government spending is the reason why the U.S. economy did so well in the second half of last year. And then on top of that, of course, all the craze about the stock market, AI, you know, the positive wealth effect, right? You know, that got this. But this is why also, like, I'm just telling you three, I mean, there were three major drivers. There was AI. There is the stock market reality, the positive wealth effect, that's one. There is government spending, that's gone. Basically, oil, that's gone. So now the question is, what is, is you know, NVIDIA going to deliver the goods this week? Right? I mean, this is a stock that's gone up 700% over the last year. Right? It's up 50% year to date. And it's a great company. Don't get me wrong. I mean, but it's trading on a PE of 100 times almost. 
is trading on a basic price to sales ratio of 40 times. I mean, at this point, somebody was telling me like, you know, based on the PE and then, you know, literally, you know, the market's projecting that in 10 years time, that this company is going to make more money than all of the entire global semiconductors right now. I mean, that is a very big number. So I think, you know, as you know, last year, the whole basically Magnificent 7 was driving the rally. But that Magnificent 7 has come down to Magnificent 3 now, right? It's basically NVIDIA, Microsoft, and a little bit of basically Amazon. The question now is that will basically NVIDIA surprise again and revise up their guidance? I actually think that if they just come in line, we're going to have a problem. <laughs> I think a lot of people are going to be looking to take some money off the table. If the stock market has any kind of correction, I think the economy is actually going to slow. So I think right now, I've been in short bonds, by the way. I was like, I was short. I made a lot of money being in short bonds starting in the second week of January all the way until last week after CPI came out. And then I basically took profit after CPI came out. I'm starting to think, well, the market is now only pricing in three cuts by the Fed before the election. If I'm right about everything else that's happening, I actually think that perhaps, you know, you know, the bond market sell off is overdone. I'm thinking about getting back maybe from the long position. So this is where it gets very interesting right now, which is that the consensus is that U.S. economy is on fire, is doing so great. We don't even need the Fed to cut anymore because the economy is going to, like, to me, people haven't really thought through about the drivers of the strong growth. And in my view, at least two of the three drivers are basically temporary drivers. And then the third one's probably temporary as well. And we'll find out from the video this week. Hey there, I hope that you are enjoying this interview. If you can, please take a moment to hit the like button, subscribe to the channel, and ring the notification bell. This will keep you up to date with all of our new interviews, and it will also help us grow this channel and continue to bring some amazing guests. Thank you so much for your support, and enjoy the rest of the interview. That's such a good point about looking at the what is driving it, the government spending, and oil uh, being another one or... Uh, the, um, so, okay, so those are like not, they're like non recurring a, as well. So, I want to hear on the economic side, do you think we are due for not just maybe a slowdown, but perhaps a recession? What is kind of the thought process there? I think, you know, this is where, again, I think when I think about the economic risk, I mean, at least for the US economy, you, I mean, there are lots of different economies, obviously. I, I think for the US economy, I think economic risk, downside economic risk in 2024, I think is not that great. Sure, so inflation is going to be a little bit higher and the Fed is going to basically take its time a little bit longer, that kind of thing. So, I mean, the worst comes to worst. I mean, the economy is going to go to like one and a half percent as opposed to like right now the market is pricing in. I mean, the market is thinking like the IMF is forecasting two and a half percent. Market is thinking it's like 1.8%. The worst comes to worst, we're going to have like 1.2% GDP growth. That would be the worst case scenario. So I'm not that I'm not that worried about a recession, especially given, you know, confinement conditions remain very, very easy. You know, like, you know, so U.S. corporate profitability is like through the roof right now. So when companies are making money, they're going to go on investing. They're going to go on hiring. So I think from that point of view, the U.S. corporate sector, you know, it looks like it's in a very good shape right now. So I'm not that worried about economic risk. I'm much more worried about political risk, of course. Right? I mean, I don't know if you saw the Wall Street Journal article last week. It was actually very interesting. So, like, so basically, Wall Street Journal decided to do this big, basically, study. Right? They sent like ten journalists across the countries, interviewing like hundreds of people in the streets, in cafes, restaurants, and trying to find out why is it that the economy is doing so well and yet consumer confidence remains so depressed. That's what they wanted to get to the bottom of. And to me, the most interesting, okay, finding they came up with was that many, many, many Americans told basically Wall Street Journal reporters that the reason why they're hunkering down, that they're worried and they're depressed and so on, that they're very concerned about political instability. They're worried about political polarization. Now, it just happens that this accords with my own view. Like I conduct a monthly survey of what I call polarization for basically the main G7 country that's US, Japan, Canada, you know, Germany, UK, France, and Italy. And the US is a standout because as late as my latest survey says that 50% of Americans, okay, believe 
that the country, okay, is extremely or very divided politically. Another 40% of Americans believe that the division, of, basically political division in this country is creating extreme, basically, political instability in the country. Now, what I can tell you is that I think these numbers are going to get much higher as we head into the election. I think it's not going to be so much the first quarter or the second quarter. In my view, it's going to be the third quarter. Once we get into July, we're four months away from the election. I think it's going to feel like shit. I think America, Americans are going to be petrified about what is going to be in store for the country in the final four months leading up to the election. Now, I think you know America was blessed with amazing, basically founding fathers, who created some really nice safeguards, okay, within the system to help the U.S. weather political crisis like the one we're about to go through. And I just think that that those safeguards are going to be seriously stress tested <laughs> in the third quarter of this year. And I think this is going to be a huge headwind for the economy, both for households and also for basically companies, because companies are going to say, well, you know, if you look at the Roundtable CEO survey, already shows that CapEx spending is going to be flat to down this year. So there's no doubt about that. I think like nobody's going to be like in this right mind. It's going to be investing, hiring, spending in the final four months, because I think it's going to get very scary. There are a lot of things that can go seriously wrong. And that is what worries me, especially given my survey also shows that the majority of Americans, it doesn't really matter whether Democrats or Republicans, they have zero trust in the political process being transparent or fair. So, you know, like this is why, you know, you know, my big prediction in 2020 before the election was that there was going to be blood on the street. I worry this time there will be a lot more blood on the street. I want to explore that even further. Um, this notion of like these safeguards to the system are going to be stress tested. This notion of this being a big headwind for the economy, not just for households, but also companies. I want to like hear more on this. I'd love for you to elaborate more, help people understand, because this sounds like a real concern, a real serious worry. I just want to hear more if you if you can. I mean, right now, let's just let's let's look at this, right? I mean, we are, you know, like, you know, I mean, Right now, today, the world is mourning over, you know, mourning the uh, the death of Navalny, right? I mean, in, in Russia, was presumably killed off by basically Putin as a political dissident and so on and so forth. But I can tell you people on the right are saying, well, you know, listen, the U.S. is no better right now. Like, you know, they're persecuting basically Trump because he's a political basically dissident. So I can tell you, like, again, I mean, depending on your point of view, I'm telling you that people on the right is already getting very, very, you know, antsy about what's actually going on. This is why every new, basically, indictment that Trump gets is basically making him even more powerful, more popular, basically, on the right, right? I mean, basically, people see him every day, more and more people see him as a martyr, as basically someone who's been crucified for his political belief and so on and so forth. So that, there's a great deal of distrust already going on there. On the other side, I don't have to tell you every day, you know, basically, in New York Times, Washington Post, somebody writes an editorial saying that if Trump is elected, that will be the end of America. That will be the beginning of dictatorship. That will be the end of American democracy. So it's cast in very black and white terms. And that's the kind of thing, you know, we're talking about safeguards. It's about, you know, basically, you know, balance of power, it's about checks and balances, and so on and so forth. But right now, I don't think, you know, you know, and, and perhaps, I don't know <laughs> what the founding fathers really thought about this type of situation that we have right now. Because the Americans right now, on both sides, are basically saying that, <coughs> are saying that this election, they believe, one side believes that we cannot allow Trump to win under any circumstances, because that would be the end of America. The other side believes that if Trump loses the election, it's only because the other side has basically stolen the election. So basically, this means that there cannot be any good outcome out of this. Because either side is going to do everything to basically make sure their guys win. And I think this is the most important thing, which is that that clash is going to happen before. This is going to be the difference between this time in 2020. The 2020 happened after the election. This time it could very well happen before. And I think that is something that I think, you know, is potentially very scary. I mean, you know, I mean, 
I mean, more and more people are talking about this. Tucker Carlson talked about this already. I mean, I've been talking about this for the last six months, which is uh, what, what happens if you wake up one morning, Trump is dead. Okay, what happens then, right? I mean, and, um, you know, I mean, at the end of the day, you know, like I, I suspect this is the reason why Trump hasn't even, you know, basically chosen a, a VP running mate. <laughs> Because it will be because if he had chosen the VP running mate and then something happens to him, that would not be the end of the world. Whereas, like, if he hasn't got a VP running mate and something happens to him, he knows that the country is going to go down the toilet. So that might make the other side think again before taking them out. So there's a lot of strategic interaction here that I think is very interesting. But most importantly, it's going to get very scary, in my humble opinion. You know? Yeah. And I, I want to just some let folks know, like, when you were on Wall Street, you've made some prescient calls, some bold calls. You mentioned the one uh, going back to 2020 about uh, the U.S. presidential election would be much closer than expected and the results would be contested. In 2016, in September of 2016, you predicted that Trump would win the presidential race um, and the Treasury yields um, and the U.S. dollar would rise afterward. And so like, when you make this call, it, it's important to, for us to listen and, and listen to your ideas and, and your thought process behind it. And you're known for being a bit of a contrarian, but you're also, you're not afraid to go against the consensus. So um, for you today, would you say is like, what is the kind of contrarian viewpoint for you today? Well, I think the contrarian, like I've got a lot of contrarian views. Like for example, like, I mean, again, I mean, I, listen, I think this is a very important thing to understand is this, right? We said before, like, you know, it was very funny because like, you know, I was talking to a client last week. It was like, wow, this guy made $100 million in 2022. And he was made a partner. And then the next year he lost $120 million, you know? And, you know, the, 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 the fact is, as I said before, like, you know, we're now in a very tough, basically macro regime. Like, you know, this is not just about hedge funds struggling to make money. I mean, even if you're long only active, you know, basically mutual fund managers, you know, you know, eight out of 10 of them are actually have been underperforming. So basically the, the entire investment industry, when they talk about alpha, like they have a lot to basically uh, <laughs> to explain. Okay. And I think, you know, because people are struggling to make money, as a result, people are increasingly reluctant to basically bet against the market, right? Because like, you know what, if you bet against the market, the market against, goes against you, like you're really screwed. You, you don't even have an excuse, right? you know, because like, <laughs> like, you know, if you think that if everybody thinks NVIDIA is going up and you don't buy, if you basically didn't buy NVIDIA and then um, you might lose your job if NVIDIA goes up. Like you, I mean, if everybody basically loaned NVIDIA and NVIDIA goes down, you're short. I don't know if you're actually going to be rewarded, but that, that's the, what I'm saying. So as a result, People tend to become, I think the market's become even more consensus driven than in the past. Okay. Now, I think the only way you can make money is by taking the other side. I mean, so it's not about taking the side, the other side after the facts. You're gonna basically take the other side before the facts because like markets these days like reprice like in milliseconds. So you if you wait until events already happen, it's too late. Okay. So you gotta basically take stick your neck out and basically say, well, this is gonna happen. Now, the beauty of doing this whole contrarian thing, it's not even so much contrarian thing. I, my starting point usually in my investment process is like, well, I try to basically find what, what trades are the most crowded and which trades is the most consensus, right? Because everybody is basically like gung-ho, you know, basically long something, bullish something, or bearish something, whatever position is already, everybody's in their grandmother's on board. Then I look, and I look to basically, I look at the investment thesis with the investment assumption and try to basically see are there any flaws or serious faults. And if I find those, I'm going to try to take the other side. Okay. That's my whole investment, basically. That's my basic investment approach is to basically try to, you know, and, 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 and you know, and, and you know, it, what it means is that when I'm wrong, I don't usually lose a lot of money. If I'm right, I can make a lot of money. And that's the beauty of the situation, because if everybody's already on this thing, even if I'm wrong, I'm going to just lo lose a little bit, okay? Because the market's already gone a very long way. So for example, if you want to know, like, what am I basically, like, wh what do I like right now, right? I mean, for example, I actually like selling US, U.S. consumer discretionary versus U.S. consumer staples, right? If you look at S&P consumer discretionary, 
you know, this baby has like massively outperformed consumer staples since September last year. I mean, fuck it, you know, with the exception of 2021 briefly, like this thing is literally at the highest level in like 15 years. Consumer, consumer discretion is done very well versus consumer staple, right? Which is not that surprising because everybody is talking about soft lending, US consumer is going to be great and this and that. And I'm telling you that actually, I don't think it's that great. I think that, you know, the whole energy boost is gone. Meanwhile, I'm seeing delinquency rate on credit cards, especially for like, a, you know, the capital one, which is used a lot by less affluent households. Delinquency rate is literally like, you know, it's going up a lot. Okay. And I think about the upcoming U.S. elections where, you know, there's going to be a lot of headwind uncertainty, which I see can also cause consumers to basically pull back. So there are a lot of, and then if the stock markets had any kind of hiccup, I think consumers are going to basically be pulling back in a very big way. And in oil price, we said, right? So all in all, I think that to me is a good example. Everybody's long U.S. consumer discretionary versus staples. Certainly price, you know, performance is consistent with that view. So how much more can this thing go? Whereas like, you know, if I'm just basically 50% right about some of the things I'm talking about, this thing can easily basically make me five to seven percent, you know, you know, if uh, if my view comes to pass in the next few months. That's an example. Yeah. Th- that, and then I also heard you earlier in the conversation talk about bonds. You had a, a short on bonds and then maybe going back into bonds. Can you elaborate there? Yeah, I, I think, listen, I, I think, you know, the bond market for, for your YouTube and podcast listener, that kind of thing, I think, you know, you... You know, investing in bond, really, you should leave it to the professionals. But in general, you know, the short-term bonds, there's medium-term bonds, long-term bonds, every basically bond has a very different trading rule, okay? I'm generally, you know, especially given that, you know, in election year, the U.S. government is doing going out of its way to help Biden win the election. So, for example, U.S. Treasury just announced they're going to be reducing the duration of the supply of treasuries in the next few months, right? I mean, that's basically saying that they're going to be issuing more shorter term treasuries in order to help bring down long term interest rates, right? Because long term interest rates drive the stock market. So if they want to basically drive up the stock market, the best way to do this is reduce duration. So all this, you got to basically take it with a grain of salt. There's a lot going on here. Okay. But I think the cleanest way, I think, to trade interest rates is really the Fed funds futures. Because like, you know, as I said before, the market right now is pricing 3.5 cuts 25 basis point cuts by the Fed between now and the end of the year. And three cuts between now and the election. So the real question is, like, you know, if you think the Fed is going to do more than three, then you want to basically be receiving the November, basically, Fed funds contract. If you think they're going to do less than that, I'm just thinking, like, right now, three, to me, is probably fair. I wouldn't say it's screaming, basically, cheap. But getting to that point now, I'm thinking that maybe it's looking attractive. Now, there's another type of bonds, which I actually am definitely a seller of. It's junk bonds, right? If you look at HYG, for example, I mean, HYG is, you know, it's, it's an ETF linked to US, basically, um, you know, junk bonds, and then, uh, which is high yield, which is below investment grade, so on and so forth. And that thing actually looks very toppish to me. If the stock market is roll over, that's going to roll over. If the stock market doesn't go down, which means that the Fed is probably going to keep rates on hold for longer, that's probably going to be a problem for high yield issuers as well. Because high, these, these junk bond issuers, they're going to have a very tough time in 2025 because a lot of, of their bonds are going to be, you know, maturing in 2025. And those of them were lucky enough to basically borrow during COVID at close to zero. They were great. But in 2025, this stuff is going to get a rollover. If the Fed has now started cutting interest rates aggressively then, they'll be basically having to roll over these debt at much higher interest rates. And this is going to be a big problem for them. So I would say that, you know, actually, yeah. so if the stock market goes down, not good for junk bonds. If the stock market doesn't go down, that's not good for junk bonds either. So I think from that point of view, I actually like basically, those are the kind of trades I'm looking looking for. Because like trades that have asymmetric risk reward. I mean, to the extent that I think there's more downside risk than there's upside risk in this case. And that's why, that's when I basically step in and take a position. Mm-hmm. 
Let me ask you this question. Um, I was reading your your background and, and listening to you earlier talking about like the worldview and um, you were born in Pittsburgh. You grew up in Taiwan. You're educated in the U.S. Um, you worked and lived in Europe and you're now in Israel today. And I am curious, David, um, you know, what what is the perception outside the U.S. of the U.S. like in conversations that you have or have you been able to kind of get a pulse there on the perception from the outside looking <clears throat> in? It's crazy. You know, like, listen, I mean, I mean, as you know, I now have a YouTube channel, which I launched two years ago. I mean, because I want to basically bring facts and numbers to public discourse. Because I think the biggest problem in the world is that there are now more opinions than there are facts, and that's bad. Okay? So I launched my YouTube channel. I mean, you're talking, to, you're talking about someone who didn't even have a YouTube account two years ago. So I'm very new at social media. I learned a great deal. I mean, to the extent that I put out videos and then I get comments and feedback and I'm, and I'm sort of to basically follow other YouTubers and trying to find out like, what is the vibe in social media about the world? Like it is shocking what's going on. Okay. For example, right. You look at, there are two wars going on, right? There's the Russia, Ukraine war, and there's the Israel, Iran war. What do you want to say? Gaza war, whatever it is. It's actually very interesting if you look at who is for which side between these two wars. It'll tell you a lot about how people actually really think. Obviously, the U.S. <coughs> is supporting Ukraine, and U.S. is supporting Israel in this war, in this war, right? So that, that's what it is. And what I find is that if I basically put out a video saying that, oh, wow, well, I'm pro, basically, like, I think U.S. is doing the right thing on Ukraine or in Israel, like, I get zero views, <laughs> okay? What the world wants is if I say that Israel is committing genocide and that, you know, basically uh, that Ukraine, you know, Zelensky's crazy, okay? Okay, it's pushing his own people. What I'm trying to tell you is this. It's actually very interesting because, again, you know, you know as you know, YouTube is the second most visited website in the world after basically Google.com, right? I mean, you're talking about- Which is owned by Google, too. views. <laughs> Right. And you're talking about people who are watching, you know, basically like, you know, these are this really gives you a global audience, even more so than CNN or anything else for that matter. And I look at people, basically the way people express themselves. It scares me because it, it, it tells me that there are many more anti-Americans than there are actually pro-Americans out there. OK. And so from that point of view, they because I don't tell you the way the world I mean, you know, you know, I don't tell you, you know, the biggest story in the world today is the power struggle between the unipolar world and the multipolar world order. It's between the global north versus the global south, between the former colonizers versus the former colonized, right? I mean, if you look at the global south, the former colonized, the whatever, the multipolar world, they represent like 80% of the world population. They now represent like 60% of the world GDP, more actually. Okay, these people, okay, are trying to basically get even and then with the West. And they see the U.S. as being this hegemon that's selfish, that wants to basically like take, take, take. I think, you know, a lot of these guys don't really understand. I mean, they, they don't understand, like it's a bit more complicated than that. But there's also no doubt that I think the Biden administration has gone a long way to reinforcing the anti-American, basically, point of view. I think Trump was a very different story. Okay. I actually think even though Trump is about make America great, Trump's isolation is basically policy, you know, in the sense that he, he doesn't want to get too involved in how other countries basically conduct their business. It actually makes basically America more friendly to the rest of the world. So I think one all, this is, this is where it is. Yeah. I mean, I, I would say for the most part, I think... Americans, you know, I don't tell you, I mean, only 60% of Americans even got a passport. So a lot of Americans never even travel outside the U.S., okay? America, because America is such a big place. Like, you could literally, you know, spend your vacation traveling around the U.S. without having to go anywhere else outside the U.S. But I think right now, if I look at the rest of the world, the way they think about the U.S., especially outside Europe, <laughs> it's actually a very sad situation because there's a lot of misunderstanding about the U.S., but it's misunderstanding mixed with mostly hostility and animosity, which has gotten much worse under the Biden administration. And, and, and I think, you know, and then you could, 
you know, this is the reason why the Tucker Carlson interview of basically of Putin has gotten 200 million views. I mean, that's incredible. It's 200 million views. I mean, only 100 million people watch Super Bowl. I mean, that interview basically got 200 million views. And then every American should basically listen to that video, to that basically interview, in my view. I mean, and then I think, you know, I've always said, you know, politicians have a tendency to talk too much without saying anything. Putin actually talked for two hours, and I think he said a lot. Whether you di- agree with him or disagree with him, that's a different story. But you should basically listen to him because I think in this interview, I think, in my view, he was a, <laughs> he was like a spokesperson of what the rest of the world views the U.S. And I think, you know, that is where I think Putin clearly is trying to, I don't know. I don't know what he was intending, but I think, you know, clearly this this basically talking basically across each other is not sustainable because then we're talking about war. I mean, this is a very, very scary situation right now because this animosity, hostility, and then meanwhile, defense spending, I'm just going to look at defense stocks. And by the way, I'm very bullish on a BAE system <laughs> that just basically sold last week, you know, essentially the uh, six frigates, okay, to, um, to Australia at $4.5 billion each. I mean, look at defense stocks. It's going crazy. I mean, and we haven't got anywhere because like still, if you look at U.S. spending on defense, it's still a fraction of what the U.S. used to spend in, in you know, in, in during the Second World War, in the 50s, 60s, 70s, even 80s for that matter. So defense spending, which is already over a trillion dollars, or U.S. budget deficit two trillion dollars, this thing is going to go through the roof. So unless America decides to start talking to the rest of the world, okay, and I'm hoping that will start under Trump because I actually think that Trump, at the end of the day, he only, you know, he's a very different person in that respect. He's not the sort of the idealist American foreign policy person. He's more of a realist, okay. I think from that point of view, like, you know, I think, you know, I think we, maybe with Trump, we're going to see, like, you know, peace returning. But I think even with Trump's coming back, so much bad blood has been spilled that, you know, you really, I just worry. I worry a lot about that. Yeah. Well, David, I have to say, it has been so great having you on the show for this conversation. I feel like I could talk to you for hours more. I Before I let you go there, David, I want to let um, you have the the final few minutes to share more about your work with David Wu Unbound. Let folks know where they can access it. I also want to hear the kind of story behind starting it and, you know, leaving, um, you know, Bank of America, Wall Street, if you will. And it makes me wonder, too, I'm, I'm a here YouTube creator. I used to work in financial media. You know, maybe being able to speak a bit more freely about some of these issues. I don't know if that's something if that's necessarily true, but I, I have a feeling maybe there's something in the name uh, David Wu Unbound. And also, any parting thoughts for the folks who are watching and listening? Um, the floor is yours. No, oh, thank you very much for that. I mean, I think you know. Listen, I mean, to be honest, like yeah, I think you know, like I I think the 2020 election really took me very hard. I mean, to be honest, I mean, I, I you know, listen, I'm. You know, I was born in the U.S., I was educated in the U.S., I became who I was because of the U.S. So, I mean, it's not the, I mean, I, you know, I live in Israel, I live everywhere and so on and so forth, but U.S. is very close to my heart because, you know, it's basically, you know, it's been good for me, let's put it that way, okay, for my career and so on and so forth. I met my wife in the U.S. and so on and so forth. But the point here is that what happened in 2020 was like, all of a sudden, it was, it, it was shocking okay what happened you know during the election we don't have to go into details but in many ways it it told me you know i mean it's sort of in, in many ways you know we're, we're seeing this again three and a half years later we're seeing basically that the, what happened in 2020 that was not over we're now about to see a replay and maybe much worse okay so from that point of view it was at that point i realized like you know what the world is going crazy like I could basically stay in my office and just talk to clients about making money, or I can do something useful. Okay. And and I think what I mean by making myself useful, right? Because at the end of the day, right? I mean, I think I acquire three skills working on Wall Street, which I think hopefully will make me someone who can basically bring facts and numbers to the wider public, which is number one, like I, I think, you know, I, I'm pretty good at simplifying complex things into you know, into basically, um, into explanations that everybody can understand. I, I like making things accessible for everybody, include, you know, because I really do believe that there's nothing too complex that you cannot make sense for everybody, 
Okay. In fact, if you cannot explain something complex to a layman, you probably don't even know what you're talking about. Okay. So I'm very good at simplifying. The second thing I was very good at, I was pretty good at basically facts and numbers. Like, you know, this is what made me good because I'm usually, I don't, I very rarely talk off my cuff. Like I'm looking under every stone, looking for a number of facts to support my investment thesis, whatever I'm saying. And the third thing what makes me pretty good is I'm a pretty good storyteller, right? I mean, that's how I did as well as I did on Wall Street was because I was a pretty good storyteller. I make a story compelling. An investment thesis compelling, people are going to get entertained, even if they don't learn something. And I thought that with these three skill sets, I was going to basically try to bring, you know, try to help, you know, basically bring facts and numbers back to public discourse. But again, I realized the last two years setting up my, I mean, and then so I've got my institutional business. I got a retail business, davidwombound.com. You want to check it out. You know, like, I mean, my institutional business, I'm servicing some of the biggest, basically, hedge funds, sovereign wealth funds, and real money investors in the world. That's a very different thing. I've got my retail, basically, um, subscription thing. But, but the, what I what it to be the most difficult thing I've embarked on was basically doing this YouTube thing, China. It's just been incredibly difficult. It's very challenging because, for one thing, people never heard of me. So, like, especially being an Asian guy, if you say anything that is not pro-American, people are going to say, well, you are a Russian bot, well, you are a Chinese spy, whatever it is. So, this is the problem. The problem in the world today is that if people disagree with you, you know, they're going to they're gonna think you're basically spreading propaganda. And this is the biggest problem. This is why if you look at YouTube, for example, people tend to only follow those channels that already are basically preaching to the uh, converted. Right, so the a, a Democrat is only going to basically listen to uh, basically a channel that's basically has a democratic basically perspective. Republicans are going to be the other way around. How many channels when you have people, Democrats and Republicans, Americans, non-Republicans, all coming together and trying to debate? That's what I'm trying to build, <laughs> and I'm finding that very very difficult. That, but I'm not giving up. So that that's probably going to be a lifelong mission. So I want to basically I have no interest in preaching to the converted. I want to basically bring people with different points of view to actually the table and trying to basically share with them facts and numbers so they can rethink about, you know, about the world according. Well, I love it. And I hope folks go and subscribe to your channel as well. And I have to say, David, it's been an absolute pleasure. Would love to get you back on the show, maybe closer to the election um, to further this discussion. But David Wu, CEO of David Wu Unbound, thank you so much for being so generous with your time and all of your knowledge. Really appreciate you taking the time, David. Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure.